on June the 26th of 2021. An off-duty police officer was knocked out at a wedding reception in Knoxville, Tennessee for pestering a man with racist comments. While in the parking lot of the wedding venue, 22-year-old Tanner Holt told Jonathan Tony that he didn't know they let black people in the reception hall. Tony, a black man, repeatedly asked the heavily intoxicated Holt to stop talking about race. The white officer refused to do so, insisting he was part of the black community. Tony couldn't take it anymore and punched Holt once, knocking him out. Officers from the Knoxville Police Department arrived at the scene, but no criminal charges were filed against Tony. Holt was taken to a hospital and subsequently recovered. He resigned from the force in October amidst an internal affairs investigation into his conduct and comments at the wedding. No charges were filed against him either. Number 7. Wooford Lomax On Christmas Day 2008, James Joseph Cialela was in a South Philadelphia movie theatre watching a screening of The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. 31-year-old Wooford Lomax was also at the Riverview movie theatre with his girlfriend and her teenage children. It was reported that they kept talking and laughing during the movie. A man in front of them, not Cialella, told them to quiet down and Lomax reportedly replied, We can't laugh? A brawl ensued between that man and Lomax during the course of which 29-year-old Cialella intervened and threw popcorn at the latter. He then brandished a kel 380 handgun and shot Lomax in the left arm, breaking it. Two versions of events emerged in the aftermath of Cialella's arrest for attempted murder, aggravated assault and weapons violations. Lomax's testimony depicted him as the main aggressor, but Cialella's defense argued that he was punched and choked as he tried to break up the fight and fired his weapon in self-defense. Cialella had spent five months in Iraq with the army before being honorably discharged in September. The attempted murder charge was eventually thrown out with his lawyer stating, he's a marksman. If he wanted to shoot to kill, he would have. In November of 2010, Cialella pleaded guilty to aggravated assault and other charges, for which he was sentenced to up to 23 months of house arrest and five years of probation. Number 6. Franklin Williams On July the 31st of 2018, Franklin Williams appeared before Judge John Russo in Cleveland, Ohio, after he'd been convicted in connection to a string of armed robberies. Throughout the 54-minute hearing, 32-year-old Williams interrupted Russo, prosecutors, and his own defense team dozens of times. Courtroom video footage showed the judge repeatedly scolding Williams as he demanded a chance to speak, stating, You are trying to take my life and you are not letting me tell you what's going on! Russo claimed that the man would have the opportunity to address the court after arguments from his legal representatives were heard. As he continued to interrupt the proceedings, Russo warned him that he would be gagged, but Williams persisted in his outbursts. The judge then ordered the deputies to tape the man's mouth. Williams tried to get up, but six deputies forced him back into his seat and placed a strip of red tape over his mouth. The video made national and international headlines, and the move was criticized by several human rights organizations, including the American Civil Liberties Union of Ohio, who described it as humiliating. Russo apologized for the decision a week later and recused himself from Williams' final sentencing. Judge Patricia Cosgrove was appointed by the Supreme Court in his stead, and she presided over Williams' sentencing in February of 2019. The defendant made no interruptions, and when he had a chance to address the court, he tried to portray himself as a social justice icon in a 12-minute statement. Williams didn't apologize to his robbery victims, instead focusing on the previous incident with Russo, claiming he'd been treated like a dog about to be put to sleep and suffered the ultimate humiliation. Williams was a repeat offender who'd been imprisoned four times in the past. His crimes included robbery, kidnapping, leading the police on a high-speed chase, as well as cutting off his ankle monitor and fleeing the state in the midst of his trial in 2017. Cosgrove called Williams a narcissistic individual who blamed others for his own actions and who'd escalated his offending over the course of a decade. In spite of spending time in prison, Russo had previously sentenced Williams to 24 years in prison, but Cosgrove handed him a 33-year sentence. Number 5. Donald Mangan 
53-year-old Kansas man Donald Mangan was arrested by Reno County law enforcement in October of 2018 for cutting a man on the forearm. Police responded to a late-night call at Mangan's home where they found Harlan Bailey on the floor with a laceration. 53-year-old Bailey told officers that Mangan had cut him because he wouldn't stop talking while he was trying to watch TV. The laceration was deep enough that the victim needed multiple stitches. Mangan was taken into custody for aggravated battery and subsequently appeared via video link from Reno County Jail. Magistrate Judge Cheryl Allen presented the details of the case to Mangan, highlighting that he'd threatened to stab Bailey if he continued to speak. Mangan replied, that's right, during the proceedings and he remained jailed on a $25,000 bond. Number 4. Lakeisha Beard Oregon woman Lakeisha Beard was arrested for disorderly conduct in the spring of 2011 for loudly talking on her cell phone while on a train from Oakland, California to Salem, Oregon. Passengers reported that 39-year-old Beard was on the phone for an estimated 16 hours and had become aggressive when she was confronted and asked to be quiet. She was involved in a verbal altercation with others on the train before resuming the loud conversation, in spite of operators asking riders not to use their cell phones. Amtrak staff called the police following repeated passenger complaints. Operators halted the train about two miles from Salem, resulting in a 20-minute delay while Beard was taken into custody. The Tigard resident later told Portland's KATU News that she'd felt disrespected in the incident. Number 3. Christopher Charles Lightsey In 1995, Christopher Charles Lightsey was on trial in California for the murder of his neighbor, cancer patient William George Compton. By then, Lightsey already had amassed a master criminal record that included convictions for drugs and inappropriate contact with minors. He was also considered a suspect in the 1990 unsolved murder of Jessica Martinez, but wasn't charged. In 1993, he attacked 76-year-old Compton, who was his neighbor on Holtby Road in Bakersfield. Lightsey fatally stabbed him 42 times and stole his gun collection, as well as a jar of coins and other items. He was ultimately tracked down, arrested and charged after one of Compton's rifles ended up at a pawn shop. On August the 15th of 1995, Lightsey had a series of courtroom outbursts that involved yelling out obscenities and making obscene gestures at the prosecution. The judge had threatened to remove Lightsey from the courtroom but ultimately decided to have him gagged with duct tape and a wad of gauze. A photo from the proceedings would show the restrained man maintaining up his disruptive behavior and showing the middle finger. Lightsey's outbursts possibly stemmed from mental health issues, as evaluators had deemed he had a narcissistic personality disorder and bipolar disorder, manic type. There was, however, speculation that his behavior in court was his attempt at being declared insane. Lightsey was ultimately deemed competent to stand trial, found guilty, and sentenced to death. Today's topic was requested by Brandon Hinricks, Mufasa Starks, and Cali Girl living in Nevada. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Kashante Short On September the 10th of 2020, Michigan woman Kashante Short filed a lawsuit against a man named Richard Jordan for standing her up on a date. Short argued that he'd intentionally caused her emotional distress because the date coincided with her late mother's birthday. They both appeared in Flint Court via Zoom in the summer of 2022, and the video subsequently went viral mainly due to Short's interaction with Judge Herman Marable Jr. He initially told the woman that she'd filed the suit in district court when she should have opted for circuit court. Jordan didn't do much talking during the hearing when asked by the judge if he'd be defending himself. The man said that he thought the suit in which Short demanded $10,000 was a waste of time, given that he'd only been on one bad date with her. Short then accused Jordan of perjury, claiming that she had the documents to prove it. Marable replied that she couldn't make that determination before asking her if she knew what perjury meant. An argument ensued during which Short repeatedly claimed that the judge was insulting her intelligence. Marable tried to explain why perjury didn't apply to the circumstances, but the conversation devolved into a shouting match. 
Short grew increasingly frustrated, screaming at the judge, repeatedly asking if they were done and refusing to answer his questions. At one point, Marable ripped off his face shield and demanded that the woman stop talking over him. A second bout of shouting erupted after Short seemingly failed to grasp that she'd have to cover Jordan's fees for filing the suit in the wrong court. The judge ultimately muted the Zoom call and transferred the suit to circuit court, but its chances of success were limited given Short's behavior and her history of initiating lawsuits deemed frivolous. In 2020, she'd sued the Flint Police Department for $300 million and also filed a suit against AT&T, both of which were dismissed. If you think running your mouth can get bad, stay tuned for the next few minutes to find out what happens when bragging goes wrong. Number 1. Esmeralda Upton In August of 2022, a Texas realtor was arrested after she was captured on video verbally abusing a group of Indian women. The encounter occurred outside the Sixty Vines wine bar in Plano, and its main aggressor was identified as 58-year-old Esmeralda Upton. Indrani Banerjee, Bidisha Rudra, and their friends were in the parking lot when Upton approached them and launched a racist tirade. Among a multitude of slurs, Upton said, I hate these Indians, and if things are so great in your country, then stay there. She lunged at the women twice and tried to grab their phones upon realizing that they were filming her. When one of the women called the police, Upton reached into her purse and reportedly threatened to shoot them. Fortunately, the situation didn't result in further violence as officers from the Plano Police Department arrived at the scene and separated them. When asked why she'd attacked the women, Upton reportedly told law enforcement that it was because they'd been filming her, adding, that's what they do, just like black people. She claimed to be Native American and Mexican American, while also mentioning that she lived in a $1.5 million house. Upton was jailed on a $10,000 bond on charges of assault and making threats. Banerjee reported that she'd been a resident of the Dallas area for 29 years, but had never felt so humiliated, threatened, and scared. As of October 2022, she and Rudra had sued Upton for causing them emotional distress. Number 7. Kishore Newell in 2016, a gang member's mother reported him to the police after hearing him brag about murdering a teenager who'd previously assisted him in a bank robbery. 19-year-old Keyshawn Newell and Jeffrey Doss, age 22, had robbed a citizen's bank in Northfield Village, Ohio, on August the 15th. The men, both reported members of the Black Disciples Street Gang, had recruited 17-year-old Brianna Fluitt to help them. However, within a few days, surveillance photos of her robbing the bank were made public. Newell and Doss became concerned that she would turn on them upon being questioned by the police. Four days after the robbery, Newell picked Fluid up from her home in a stolen SUV alongside three other teenagers. He told them to switch seats with him so that he could make out with her. They drove to East Cleveland where Newell executed Fluid. He shot her two times in the SUV and three more times as she lay dying on the ground outside of the vehicle. Newell's mother contacted the police after he'd bragged about the killing. The teenagers provided the authorities with evidence against him in exchange for their charges to be kept in the juvenile court. He was sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 49 years. Number 6. Katie Price In 2019, British celebrity Katie Price faced a considerable degree of public backlash and was accused of making light of drunk driving. The former model's pink Range Rover had crashed on October the 10th of the previous year. Price was found in the back seat and, upon being questioned by the police, claimed that one of her friends had been driving the vehicle, after which they'd fled the scene. She didn't, however, provide the authorities with the name of said friend, which led to speculation about her story being a fabrication. Price was reportedly nearly twice the legal limit, as the Range Rover crashed into a hedge in a parked vehicle in London. No one was hurt, but the incident was just one of many legal issues involving Price's driving in the past, some of which included speeding, running a red light, and driving while on her cell phone. For the latest incident, she wasn't found to be a credible witness and was ultimately given a three-month driving ban 
on the lesser charge of being drunk while in charge of a motor vehicle. She celebrated her conviction outside the courthouse, claiming, Brilliant! I thought I was going to get two years! Price was seen pumping her fist in the air and boasted that she was going to go car shopping. The public viscerally reacted to her attitude. One woman, whose teenage daughter had been killed in a drunk driving incident, called it disgusting and a way of trivializing a serious issue. Price was also accused of setting a bad example and of getting off with a lighter sentence simply because of her celebrity status. Number 5. Blake Fisher In October of 2018, an Idaho Fish and Game Commissioner resigned from his position amidst controversy regarding his recent hunting trip to Namibia. In mid-September, he'd sent an email with photos bragging about his expedition to over 100 colleagues and friends. The images showed Fisher and his wife standing next to the bodies of various kills which included a leopard, an oryx, a giraffe, a water buck, and perhaps, most worrisome, an entire baboon family. Fisher boasted that he'd killed the latter as a way of introducing his wife to hunting in Africa, claiming that she got the idea quick. Many of his colleagues found the images and the callous tone of the email unsettling. Former commissioners of the Idaho Department of Fish and Game spoke out against what they believed to be a lurid perspective on hunting and an attitude that tarnished the department's reputation. They called for Fisher to resign, which he did, but told a Boise newspaper that he didn't feel he'd done anything unethical and immoral. Number 4. Arta Tomawayak while intoxicated, Arta Tomawaik crashed his Mercedes S600 into another vehicle and killed its occupant. Only seconds after boasting to a passenger about his drug driving skills. In October of 2018, Tomawaik was speeding down Mort Lane in Tildesley, Manchester. He was doing over 70 miles per hour in a 30 mile per hour area when he collided with a Volkswagen Golf. 71 year old Kathleen Brogan was a front seat passenger while her daughter Jill was behind the wheel. The golf spun 180 degrees and was hurled tens of feet back up the road. Brogan was killed while Jill was rushed to the hospital with fractures to both legs and to her pelvis. 39-year-old Tom Wyeck suffered internal injuries, as did his passenger, Zygmunt Putek. The audio from dashcam footage revealed a conversation between the two men. Putek had repeatedly asked Tom Wyeck to slow down, claiming that he had children, to which the latter replied, I'm a better driver when I've had a drink. Moments later, he crashed into the Volkswagen. Earlier that day, Tom Wyeck had downed a third of a whiskey bottle and was double the legal alcohol limit. He pled guilty to causing death and serious injury by dangerous driving, for which he was sentenced to 88 months in prison and banned from driving for nine years and 10 months. Number three, murder of Daniel Halseth. On April the 9th of 2021, the body of 45-year-old Daniel Halseth was found burnt from head to toe in the garage of his Las Vegas home. Prior to being stuffed into a sleeping bag and set ablaze, he'd been stabbed and cut at least 70 times. There were also wounds on his body to suggest attempted dismemberment. The police was only hours into the investigation when they were approached by the parents of 18-year-old Aaron Guerrero. They were concerned that he'd run away with Halseth's daughter, Sierra, also in her late teens. She and Guerrero had been dating between June and December of 2020, but their parents then kept them apart after finding out about their plan to run away to Los Angeles together. As the investigation progressed, it was revealed that Sierra had used her father's debit cards. Surveillance cameras from local stores had captured her and Guerrero buying disposable gloves, a circular saw and saw blades, bleach and lighter fluid. Many of the items were found at the crime scene along with a handsaw and two folding knives. It's believed that Sierra and Guerrero murdered Halseth and then tried burning the body in parts of the house to cover their tracks. The two had fled to Salt Lake City, where they were arrested on April the 13th. In the aftermath, the authorities found a disturbing video on YouTube of Sierra and Guerrero apparently bragging about the murder. The couple appeared to be inside a tent as Guerrero boasted to the camera, welcome back to our YouTube channel, day three after murdering somebody as they each held three fingers up. Sierra then told Guerrero not to say that on camera before he cradled her head and claimed that it had been worth it. Their trial is ongoing, but some reports claimed that prosecutors pondered pursuing the death penalty for Guerrero. The teens both pled not guilty. 
Today's topic was requested by Wish Good Girl. If you have any other topics you'd like to learn about, subscribe and let us know in the comments section below. Number 2. Twain Gotti In July of 2013, a rapper was charged with double homicide after boasting in his lyrics about slaying a rival gang member. The case had gone cold for the 2007 murders of 16-year-old Christopher Horton and Brian Dean, aged 20, who'd been gunned down on the porch of a Virginia home. Then, in 2011, a break came after a detective newly assigned to the case was tipped off about a YouTube song called Ride Out, performed by 22-year-old local rapper Antoine Stewart, also known as Twain Gotti. He was reportedly becoming prominent on the music scene, having released several mixtapes, performing in East Coast shows and signing with a New York-based management firm. In the song that allegedly referenced Horton's killing, he bragged how everyone had seen when he choked him on the porch, but he goes on to imply there were no witnesses when he smoked him and 357 Smith & Wesson scoped him. Roughly one year after the charges, Stewart was acquitted of the double murder but instead got 16 years for additional charges stemming from the shooting. They were two use of a firearm counts and one for shooting into an occupied dwelling. Stewart stated an intention of appealing the sentence. His conviction refueled conversations about First Amendment rights and if rap lyrics on which most of the case against Stewart have been built are entirely protected by freedom of speech or if they may be used as evidence. Number 1. Jorge Avia Torres On July the 12th of 2009, a welfare check was performed at the Joint Base Meyer Henderson Hall in Arlington, Virginia, after Navy Petty Officer Second Class Amanda Snell failed to turn up for her shift. The door was unlocked while her purse and ID were still in the room. Snell's decomposing body was found inside a closet and it was ultimately determined that the 20-year-old had been killed through some form of strangulation. DNA samples were taken from the scene and because of how tightly monitored the base was, the killer was suspected to have been stationed there. For months, none of the leads had panned out until February of 2010. Following the kidnapping of three women in Arlington, their aggressor had taken them at gunpoint and bound them with electrical cords in their Ballston apartment. He then took one of the victims to a secluded area in his SUV, repeatedly choked and abused her before leaving her for dead next to a highway. She survived, as did the others, and they were able to provide the authorities with a description of the vehicle and their aggressor. The information consequently led them to Jorge Avia Torres. He was a Marine who lived at the base just two doors down from Snell. A search of his vehicle tied him to the February attack, while his DNA was found to match samples recovered from that crime scene as well as from the bedsheets in Snell's room. Following Torres' arrest, his cellmate Osama El Atari approached the authorities claiming that he'd been bragging about killing Snell. El Atari was serving time for defrauding several banks of an estimated $53 million and agreed to wear a wire in exchange for a lesser sentence. It would subsequently provide investigators with the chilling record of Torres describing how he'd tied Snell up with a cable from her laptop and choked her to death. The DNA evidence, coupled with the jailhouse confession, was enough to secure a conviction, but the series of gruesome revelations was far from over. After running his DNA through a database, Torres was connected to a horrific 2005 double homicide in his hometown of Zion, Illinois, when he was still in his late teens. The victims had been abused, killed, and their eyeballs had been cut out of their sockets. It's believed that he joined the Marines to lower suspicions. He was sentenced to death for Snell's murder as well as the double homicide and is currently awaiting execution at USP Terre Haute. Thanks for watching. Would you rather speak your thoughts with no filter or feel a mild electric shock whenever you said a curse word? Let us know in the comments section below.